Hello, good morning everyone, Rich Vaughn here, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to have a look at this new Panasonic Lumix S52X. The Panasonic Lumix S52X is in a lot of ways very similar to the Panasonic Lumix S52 because it is basically the S52 with some additional new features. So in this video, we will primarily focus on the new feature and changes that comes with the S52X, but we will also have a quick overview of the S52 and I will also share with you some of the additional thoughts and experience after using the S52 for about 6 months now. So the Panasonic Lumix S52 and the S52X use the same image sensor, the same L-square technology processor that was created with Leica together and the body is almost identical. Every feature that you can find on the S52, you can also find it on the S52X. The Lumix S52X is like an enhanced version of the S52 and it has some additional features the basic S52 doesn't have. Some of the photos, videos, and test results that I'm going to show you in this review were shot using the Lumix S52, and that's because the basic performance of the S52 and the S52X should be identical. We are going to go through and talk about all these new features in depth in this review, but here is a very quick summary of the extra features that is offered by the Lumix S52X. The first one is the USB SSD recording. So this is a feature that we first saw from Panasonic on the Lumix GH6 and now it's also available on the S52X to allow you to record video and also photos using an external SSD drive. The second is the all intra codec. I know there are quite a few of you who want this less compressed but easier to edit codec, which in some situation would also provide higher video quality when compared to the standard long gob videos. Then we have the ProRes video recording. This is the industry standard format that delivers very high quality video but also very easy to edit as well. Now, if you want the ultimate image quality for your video, the S52X provides raw video output while HDMI, so you can record raw video in ProRes RAW or Blackmagic RAW format using a supported external video recorder. Yes, Blackmagic RAW or B-RAW is back. If you want to do live streaming, the S52X provides a few different options for you to do that without having to buy any dedicated streaming hardware. And last but not least, at least not to me, is that it has the all black body design that I think just looks super cool. Now before we start talk about the S52X and all those new changes in depth, I want to clarify a few things first. There seems to be a, a lot of confusions and also wrong information about what is the difference between the S52 and the S52X, what can be shared between these two cameras, and also for those of you looking at upgrading from the original S5, is there anything that can be shared between the original S5 and the new Mark II cameras? First, if you are upgrading from the Lumix S5, the battery, the battery charger that you had for the S5 is exactly the same. The S52 and the S52X don't come with the standard battery charger, so you may want to hold on to your S5 battery charger if you don't want to rely on USB charging. The battery grip for the Lumix S5 BGS5 also works on the Lumix S52 and the S52X. In fact, the battery grip for the S5 is the official grip for the S52 and the 2X. Everything works. The only thing is the joystick on the S5's battery grip is a four directional one, while the joystick on the S52 and the 2X body is a eight directional one. And since there is some really minor difference in terms of the body shape of the S5 compared to the 2 and 2X, so part of the grip doesn't line up quite perfectly. To me, I don't think it really matters at all, but I want to point it out and let you aware of it. Because the S5 2 and the 2X 
viewfinder area is much bigger as it has a built-in cooling fan there. So the cage for the S5 won't fit on the S5 II or the S5 II X at all. But on the other hand, since the body design of the S5 II and the 2X are identical, so the cage is the same for the S5 II and the S5 II X. Right now, I have the small rig S5 II cage mounted on the S5 II X and it fits perfectly. I have done a comparison review of several cages for the S5 II including this small rig one and also Tilter and the one from Condor Brew. So if you are interested in getting a cage for your S5 II X, you should check out my comparison review after watching this video. On a similar topic, Condor Brew has just announced a new Pro Bray SSD handle. It is a camera handle with a built-in slot for the SanDisk Pro Bray SSD drive, which allows you to easily and securely attach external SSD drive to your S5 2X. Technically, it is not a S5 2X accessory because it can also be used on a number of other cameras including the Lumix GH6 and cameras from other brands as well. Now, while you can also use that handle on a S5 II because it's just a handle, the SSD recording feature wouldn't work because S5 II doesn't support SSD recording. The Panasonic XLR adapter XLR1 would work on the S5 II and the S5 IIX, the dummy battery DCC17 and the remote shutter DMWRS2 for the S5 would also work on the S5 II and the S5 IIX. Panasonic cameras have a very nice feature that allows you to export your camera's setting to a memory card and then you can import it to another camera of the same model. So obviously you can't export the S5 camera settings to the S5 II as they are completely different cameras. I tried to export the camera setting from the S5 II and import to the S5 IIX. Unfortunately, even though these two cameras are very similar, I cannot import the setting from the S5 II to the S5 IIX. For every new camera release, it usually takes a bit of time for the software companies like Adobe to support the photo raw file of the new camera. It's not just for Panasonic, it's the same for all the other brands. So those of you who bought the S5 II, especially if you pre-ordered one, would have waited quite a while for the third-party raw photo support. But if you are buying the S5 IIX and you use Adobe software, then the good news is the Adobe software can already handle S5 IIX raw file, so you don't have to wait a few weeks or months to get the raw support this time. Since the Lumix GH4, Panasonic offers an optional software upgrade key for people who want to unlock some of the most advanced features on some particular cameras. So this Upgrade key was available for a number of cameras including GH4, GH5 and the Lumix S1 and it is now also available for the S5 II as well and if you purchase the upgrade key then it will give you raw video output for your S5 II which is a standard feature for the Lumix S5 IIX. We will talk about the raw video output in a minute but I want to clarify one thing. Raw video output is what? the S5-2's software upgrade key would give you, there's nothing more. Buying the upgrade key for the S5-2 won't give you the all intra or ProRes recording and it also won't give you the USB SSD recording or the live streaming feature that the S5-2X offers. Okay, now let's talk about the new S5-2X features and also a quick recap of the basic features that shares between the S5-2 and the S5-2X. I won't go really in depth into some of those basic features because I have already covered them all in my 97 minutes long Lumix S5 II review. So I suggest you to watch that video if you haven't already after watching this one as there are a lot of in-depth discussions, real-world testing and also comparison with other cameras in that review. Now let's talk about the body design and the general control of the S5 IIX first. As I've mentioned at the beginning, the S5 IIX shares the same body design as the S5 II. 
The size of the camera is very similar to the competitors like the Sony A7 series or the Canon R6 or the Nikon Z6, Z7 series cameras. Panasonic always does a pretty good job in the ergonomic design and this S52X is the same. The camera feels very comfortable when I hold it with my medium sized hands. The grips feel good. The buttons and control layout is also very sensible. I really like the white balance, ISO and exposure compensation buttons at the top of the grip here which allows me to change this setting super easily. And there are also a decent but not super crazy number of other buttons on the camera as well. You can also customize the buttons very easily by long pressing the button and assign the custom setting that you want. The body design of the S5 II and the 2X is very similar to the original S5, but there are quite a few upgrades. For example, the joystick is now a 8 directional one. The shape of the grip is slightly different and provides a little bit more support. The eye sensor for the EVF is now moved from the bottom to the top side of the EVF to make it not so easy to miss trigger. The EVF is also higher resolution. We have a full size HDMI port. But the biggest and also most surprising change in my opinion is that there is a cooling fan building at the EVF hum area. I think this is a genius design as it allows the camera to run much cooler and not worry about overheating but also avoid making the camera body a lot more bulky or thicker. With the cooling fan and some ventilation holes at the EVF, the S52 and the S52X is still a weatherproof camera and I have definitely tested both cameras quite a bit under bad weather condition with no issues at all. The main difference between the S52 and the S52X body is that all the logos, dials and buttons on the S52X are black and also the finish of the dial are a little bit different. They are not so refractive, not so shiny and all the fonts are grey colour instead of white. So it looks a lot more low key. Even the Lumix logo on the camera strap is designed in a similar way. I usually don't use the original camera strap that comes with the camera because I don't like the big bright manufacturer logo on those camera straps. But I can see myself using the one that comes with the S52X if I bought one myself because it just looks a lot more subtle and I love it. The only thing that has color is the red video record button. This is the first Lumix camera has this kind of all black design. But there are other brands that have released camera with similar design. For example, Leica's M10P was created with a similar concept. Now all these differences are purely aesthetics. So do you like it or not is really personal. I myself really love it and I've done similar things with some of my previous cameras, especially when I want to be a bit more stealthy when doing street photography or when I travel to places that I just don't want to draw people's attention to my camera. However, I do notice there is one downside when I was out there shooting and testing the S52X in the evening. Because the dials are all black with the markings in grey, compared to the normal version which is black and white. So when I want to change the mode using the mode dial, it could be really hard to see what mode you are now using or you are switching to when it's dark. So yes, this is definitely a downside and it may affect the usability if you are someone who need to shoot at dark environment quite a bit. The camera is responsive. I always love Panasonic's manual system and the touch screen interface works for almost everything from shooting photo, video as well as changing settings. The only thing that I don't really like is that the first time you power on the camera on a particular day, the camera would take quite a bit of time to turn on. It is noticeably longer than most cameras that I have used in the past. Sometimes I even thought I forgot to put a battery into the camera as I waited quite a few seconds after I flicked the power switch and the screen is still black. I want to clarify that this is only for the first time you turn on the camera on a particular day. When you turn on the camera again later on that day, the power on time is a lot faster. Now according to Panasonic, 
The reason why it took quite a bit of time to power on the camera for the first time is that there are people that complain about some of their previous cameras, the battery would drain power quite a bit when the camera was just sitting on the shelf in storage. So they make the camera go into a deep sleep mode when the camera detected it wasn't used for a certain period of time. And because of that, it takes longer time to wake up the camera. Now, because I do use my camera all the time, so I never really noticed the battery drain issue with their previous cameras. So this change doesn't really benefit me and actually make it slightly more inconvenient to me occasionally. But I would like to hear what you think about this and if you had issues about battery drain, no matter it's with a Panasonic camera or other brands. Okay, now let's talk about the video mode. The S52X, just like the S52, is mostly a 10-bit video camera. What I mean is, if you shoot in the MOV format, all the recording options are 10-bit, and there are lots of different recording options. If you want to record in 8-bit, you could do that by switching to the MP4 output format. The video resolution is from 1080p up to 6K. In terms of frame rate, at 6K, you can shoot up to 30 frames per second. At 4K, you can shoot up to 60 frames per second. However, with 50 or 60 frames per second at 4K, you do have the APS-C crop just like the original S5. In 1080p, you can shoot up to 120 frames per second with autofocus or 180 frames per second with manual focus. If you shoot at 180 frames per second, there will be a bit of crop and also the image quality will drop a bit. Because of the built-in cooling fan, overheating is not really an issue with the S52 or the S52X. While there is a soft time limit for some of the internal recording options that you can turn off, when I switch off the time limit, I never have any overheating issues at all. Just like pretty much all the mid to high-end Panasonic Lumix cameras, there are lots of features for video shooters, including some really useful features that are not available on most other cameras of the similar price range. The first one I want to talk about is the new feature called Real-Time LUT. With this feature, you can import your own LUT onto the camera and then you can apply the LUT and have it baked into your video footage. So this is really useful when you want to have fast turnaround time so you can just apply your own creative LUT and have the recorded video with your own particular look. It is also very useful if you're shooting with multiple cameras, especially some from other brands that have quite different colors. So you can apply a technical LUT to transform the colors to match the video files from other cameras. I think the real-time LUT is a fantastic feature and I really like it. The only thing I wish the camera can do is when you are recording the video to both card slots, I want to have one version with the LUT applied and the other one without the LUT applied so that I can keep the original version that I want to do some more editing myself later on. This is something that I really want but it's not currently available on the S52X. Another great feature is you can shoot in open gate mode. What open gate mode means is the camera can record video using the full width and full height of the sensor. There are many reasons why you want to do that. One is that it allows you to shoot both the traditional video and vertical video at the same time and crop them out much easier in post-processing. I've created a video that shows you some of the tricks about how to do that easily using the Assist tools available on the camera like the S52X. So I suggest you to check out that video as well after watching this video. Another advantage of shooting in open gate mode is, since the video aspect ratio for the open gate mode is 3 to 2, so if you want to shoot anamorphic videos, you can choose an anamorphic lens that has a higher squeeze factor to create the more noticeable oval shaped bokeh that you've seen in big Hollywood movies. Right now, I'm also reviewing the Xray 135mm anamorphic lens that has a 1.8 squeeze factor. This is perfect for the S52X open gate mode. 
If I use it on other camera that can only do 16 to 9 aspect ratio, the result aspect ratio would be 3.2 to 1. That is just really a bit too much for most usage. And speaking of anamorphic, Panasonic is the only major camera manufacturer right now that offers you really good anamorphic support for their mirrorless cameras. You have the anamorphic discrete display so you can preview the image correctly without having to use an external monitor to do the discrete. The in-body image stabilization system also has a special anamorphic mode so the image stabilization system will work correctly when shooting with the anamorphic lens, especially when you are shooting something with a big squeeze factor like the 1.8 times ray that I'm testing right now. On a related topic, one thing that I do really want and I have talked to Panasonic many times is that I want to have anamorphic support for photo mode as well. So what I mean is I want to have that anamorphic discrete display in the photo mode as well as right now if I want to shoot some anamorphic photo, I have to first go to the video mode to preview the output with the discrete display and then switch back to the photo mode and take the photo and then switch back to the video mode again. Now before I talk about the new recording options available on the S52X, I want to talk about the USB SSD recording first because it is essential for some of the new recording options. So just like the Lumix GH6, the S52X also allows you to plug in a SSD drive to the camera's high-speed USB-C port and you can record your video as well as photos to the SSD drive directly. There are several advantages using the SSD drive for recording. The first one is SSD drive is just much cheaper than the fast SD cards in general. It typically costs between 100 to 200 US dollars right now for a fast V90 128GB SD card. But for the same price, you can easily get a 1TB or 2TB SSD drive which gives you 10 to 20 times more capacity. The second reason is the much faster write and read speed. SD cards, even the fastest one, has the maximum write speed of around 200 to 300 megabytes per second. SSD drive can quite often get up to 2000 megabytes per second, so it is a lot faster. And that's why with the S52X, some of the highest quality recording options can only be recorded to the SSD drive. And the third reason is not a very obvious one. Using SSD for recording would give the camera much better cooling. Writing a lot of data to the memory card can generate a lot of heat. This is very obvious for camera that use the CF Express cards, but it also applies to the other media types, especially when it's a memory card that is completely stored inside the camera. So with the SSD drive that is exposed outside the camera, Cooling is a lot better and it doesn't build up as much heat inside the camera body. I never have any overheat issue with the S52 or the S52X myself, but if you are living in some really hot places, this might be another good reason for you to use SSD recording instead. But while using SSD can offer you some advantages, there are some certain things that you have to consider if you want to do that. For example, how do you attach the SSD security to your camera? I've mentioned earlier in this review that Condor Brew has just released a new handle which allows you to use the SanDisk Pro Bray SSD drive with the S52X. I haven't tried it myself, but by looking at the design, it looks really cool and allows you to attach the SSD drive securely to the camera and also you can swap it out very easily. So definitely check it out if you're interested in doing SSD recording with your S52X. Now there are a few things that you need to aware if you want to use SSD with your S52X. The first one is the maximum size of the SSD drive that is supported by the S52X is 2TB. You cannot use any SSD drive that is larger than that. Panasonic has tested a number of SSD drives and they have listed the one that they have verified on their website. This is what they have currently listed. 
But if you are watching this review later than May 2023, I suggest you check out Panasonic's website for the latest compatibility list. I'll put a link in the video description below. And the second thing is, Using SSD drive would use up your USB port and there's only one USB port on the camera. So that means you can't use USB to power the camera or do the USB live streaming option that we are going to talk about later on in this review. But if you really want to power the camera externally, you could use the dummy battery and power it with other external power source. If you're using SSD to record photo or video, unfortunately, the internal SD card cannot be used at the same time. So if you're shooting video and want a backup copy, the only workaround is that if you attach an external video recorder through the HDMI connection, and then you can record a backup copy of video using your external video recorder. Since the S52X supports USB SSD, this feature also works for photo mode. If you need big storage space, for example, you are shooting time-lapse photos, the SSD would be a great and affordable way to provide you huge storage space. Now, the S52X does have a pretty big memory buffer for shooting photos in burst mode, but I did wonder, if using the USB SSD option would allow me to shoot even more photos or allow me to clear the buffer faster. So I did some tests to compare the SanDisk Extreme 1TB SSD with the ProGrade 64GB V90 card. What I found is, if I shoot in high speed burst mode with raw output, the number of photos I could take before the buffer is full, and the time it takes to write all the photos once the buffer is full is virtually the same between the two options. So unfortunately, you don't get bigger buffer or faster write speed by using a faster SSD drive. Okay, now we have talked about the USB SSD recording. Let's go back and continue to talk about video recording. The first new recording option added to the S52X is the All Intra Codec. Unlike the default long gob recording codec used by the S52, which compresses a group of frames together to allow better compression, All Intra Codec encode each frame separately, which means the file size of your video is larger, but it also means if you're editing video on a computer, the computer can decode any frame much easier as it doesn't need to decode a bunch of frames just to get one of the frame. With the all intra option, the Lumix S52X can record at bit rate up to 800 megabit per second when recording cinema 4K or 4K. You can record all intro files to either the SD card or the SSD drive, but for the highest 800 megabit per second output, you need to record to an external SSD drive because the SD card just not fast enough. However, for all those 800 megabit per second recording options, the camera also provides a slightly lower 600 megabit per second option that you can record to the internal SD card if you want. All the all intra recording options uses the H.264 compression. If you want really high quality video that is easy to edit, the S52X also offers ProRes and ProRes HQ recording. There are a number of different recording resolutions available from Full HD all the way to 5.8K due to the low compression of the ProRes formats which allows the files to be edited very easily. The bitrate of the ProRes file is really high and it could go up to maximum 1.6 gigabit per second for some of the ProRes HQ option. Because of that, most of the ProRes options can only be recorded to the external SSD drive. Only the 1080p ProRes or the ProRes HQ files can be recorded to the SD card. If you want the ultimate quality, raw video is what you would go for. The S52X supports ProRes raw recording when used with one of the supported Atomos device, which is Ninja 5, Ninja 5 Plus, and the Shotgun Connect. It also supports Blackmagic RAW, B-RAW, 
Yes, Blackmagic RAW or B-RAW is back and you can record B-RAW using one of the supported Blackmagic device. The supported Blackmagic devices are the Blackmagic Video Assist 5-inch or 7-inch 12G HDR. No matter you want to shoot in ProRes RAW or B-RAW, you have three different output resolution. Full frame 5.9K 16 to 9 at 24, 25 and 30 frames per second. APS-C 4.1K at 17 to 9 aspect ratio at 24, 25, 30, 50 or 60 frames per second. And APS-C 3.5K 4 to 3 aspect ratio at 24, 25, 30 or 50 frames per second. All these options are 12-bit output. You also need the latest firmware for your Atomos or Blackmagic device for the raw recording. Since I have recently switched from using Adobe Premiere Pro to DaVinci Resolve for my video editing, I would be really interested in trying out the B-RAW output, but I don't have a Blackmagic recorder right now, so I will look into getting one and try it out in the future. Now I think some of you may have a question, does that mean Blackmagic RAW will be coming to the GH6? I've asked Panasonic this question and I didn't get an answer, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. While I think most of the people who are buying the S5 2X is primarily for its video feature, but the S5 2X is actually a very solid photo camera as well and in some way I can argue it is the best photo camera at its price range. So. The image sensor is 24 megapixel, not really high resolution, but the camera has a multi-shot high resolution mode that can generate 96 or 48 megapixel high resolution photo by combining the photos from multiple exposure. The best thing is the creation of the high resolution photo is done completely in camera, so you don't need to use a computer and other software to create that high resolution photo. Panasonic is the only company that their full frame camera can generate this multi-shot high resolution photo in camera at the moment. The output high resolution photo can be in RAW or JPEG or both formats as well. Compare it with other camera that require you to use a computer and special software to create a high resolution photo later on yourself. You will not notice if there's some issues with the photo until you got home. The S52 and the S52X is much better because the camera will create a high resolution photo straight after you took it, so you will notice if there is any issue immediately. Another feature that is also unique to the Lumix for their full frame camera is the live view composite mode. This feature was also available on the original S5 and I have used it quite a lot on the S5 myself. Basically, it is for you to do long exposure photo, but it's different to the normal long exposure photo. With the normal long exposure photo, for example, if you are doing a 10 minutes long exposure, the camera would build up the exposure slowly, very slowly, during that one long continuous 10 minutes exposure. But with the live view composite mode, the camera would take many, many photos continuously and blend the photos together by only making the dark area brighter to create the long exposure effect. So for the same 10 minutes exposure in the live view composite mode, the camera could take 60 photos for example, each with a 10 seconds exposure instead. So the difference is any of this 10 second exposure photo would already have the correct exposure. The area in this 10 second photo that doesn't change will be what you will see in the final photo already. The camera will just blend the moving part together using computational photography tricks to help you capture the motion similar but not identical to a normal long exposure photo. So why would you want to do that? Well, there are a few reasons. The first reason is, it's a lot easier to set the correct exposure, especially if you are planning to do some really super long exposure photo like an hour or longer. If you do normal long exposure, the camera wouldn't be able to calculate the correct exposure settings for you for such a long exposure. So you have to do your own math. And if you did it wrong, 
which I did quite often, you won't know that until after you finish your shop. So if the exposure is one hour long, you would have wasted an hour before you realize your mistakes. But with the live view composite mode, you can just set the exposure like you are doing a normal photo with much shorter exposure time, even if the total exposure time is much longer. And since each exposure is much shorter, the camera can help you to get the correct exposure settings. And the second reason is, with Live View Composite, you can instantly see how your photo looks like during the exposure. You will see the progress and the camera will update you with the result as it's taking the photo. So you can choose to stop anytime you want. So if you are taking light trail photos, you can control precisely how much light trail you get in the photo instead of having to guess the exposure time before you click the shutter button. And if you did something wrong, maybe your position of the light trail is not at the right spot or the exposure setting is just wrong, you will also see it immediately and you can stop it, adjust the camera and redo it straight away without having to wait a very, very long time. And the third reason is, if you are doing a long exposure during the day, with the normal long exposure, you almost certainly have to bring a ND filter to avoid overexposing the scene. But with Live View Composite, you could usually get away without an ND filter because each exposure is much shorter. And since the live view composite mode is only adding light to the dark part of the scene instead of making the whole photo brighter and brighter, it's much easier to have a more balanced exposure straight out of the camera without having to use any of the graduate ND filter to darken the brightest area of the scene, like buildings with bright lights at night. Now, the live view composite mode does not give you exactly same look of result when you compare to the traditional long exposure photo. So in some cases, you may still prefer to do the normal long exposure photo instead. But overall, I find myself, I use the live view composite mode a lot more than the traditional long exposure when I was shooting with the S5 and now with the S5 2X. The thing is, with the S5 2X, you have the choice to choose which mode works the best for you. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to mention as well. With the live view composite mode, you can only shoot it in the full menu and mode. You cannot shoot in P, A or S mode. The reason is because you need every photo to have the same exposure setting, even if the light condition changes. So it makes sense we have to shoot in M mode and lock the exposure settings. The ISO is limited to between 100 and 3200. You cannot go any higher than 3200. But since we are doing long exposure photos, so I don't think ISO 3200 limit is actually a problem. For the shutter speed, the slowest shutter speed per exposure is 60 seconds, which is pretty long. And the fastest shutter speed is 1 over 1.6 seconds, and you cannot go any faster than that. Sometimes I would want to go a little bit faster, but I guess the reason why you cannot go faster is because the camera need a bit of time to process each exposure and merge it with the previous exposure before it can capture another one. So if the shutter speed is set to too fast, then the camera cannot handle it fast enough and you'll probably see the light trail would have lots of gaps in between. And yes, just like the multi-shot high resolution mode, you do not need a computer and extra software to create that photo. The camera would process the photo in camera and it will output your final RAW or JPEG file or both depends on your preference. So overall, I really like this live view composite mode, but there's one thing that I don't really like. It's not about the feature itself. It's about how to trigger the feature. To shoot in live view composite mode, you have to go into the camera menu system to enable it. I really wish it can be accessed from the camera's mode dial. 
Panasonic has already moved the high resolution mode to the mode down. So I don't know why they didn't do the same thing for this live view composite mode. One of the biggest improvements that comes with the S5 2X is the new hybrid autofocus system. Panasonic has been using DFD contrast based only autofocus system for their mirrors cameras for a very long time. Their latest DFD autofocus system's performance is actually pretty solid, but it definitely has its weakness and it is not as responsive as some of the leaders in the market. So finally, we have Lumix mirrors camera that use PDAF face detection autofocus combining with their contrast-based autofocus system. And the result? Well, as Panasonic's first attempt, honestly, I was expecting the autofocus performance may not be that good. After all, it took Sony quite a few years before they got their PDAF system to work well. Canon and Nikon have also spent a few years to get their mirrorless cameras AF system to perform the same as their Pro DSLRs. So it's not exactly an easy task. But when I did my S5 II review, I compared the S5 II with Sony's A7 IV and Canon R6 II. I found S5 II's video autofocus performance is actually very similar to the latest Sony and Canon. Well, it's not perfect. There are definitely things that Panasonic can fine tune and improve. But overall, I can say Panasonic now finally has an autofocus system that is very close to the market leader in the video mode at least. It is fast, it is reliable, some areas like the object detection may be still a little bit simple, but human detection works good enough. When shooting photos, the new autofocus system also helps. The AFC mode works much better. We don't see that constant pausing in the preview anymore. The accuracy and success rate of tracking is certainly much better than the S5. However, I would say the autofocus improvement in photo mode is not as huge as the video mode. If you want to get the best performance when you are taking photos, you need to fine tune the AF settings. While with the cameras from the other brands, you don't need to do quite as much adjustments to get similar performance. One more thing I want to point out is, if you're shooting video in 1080p, full frame in 50 or 60 frames per second, the autofocus would use contrast-based detection and not the new hybrid detection that uses PDAF. This is the same for the S5 II and the S5 IIx, and I wasn't aware of that when I was doing the S5 II review because, to be honest, I myself, I do not normally shoot in 1080p at all these days. But I understand some people do still shooting in 1080p and some people prefer the 1080p 50 or 60 frames per second because they don't like the APS-C crop. So I want to point out in case it is a deal breaker for you. Another big upgrade that comes with the S5 II and the S5 IIx is the in-body image stabilization system, IBIS. The super rating of this new IBIS is the same as the classic S5, which is 5 stop, which is not really a very impressive number. However, the super IBIS rating is for the photo mode. For video, that number doesn't really mean much. There are some cameras in the market with very high super IBIS rating, but very poor video mode IBIS performance. When shooting video handheld with the S5 II and the S5 IIx, I noticed some pretty noticeable difference when compared to the original S5. The stabilization system is very effective. In some situations, it is really almost gimbal-like. When I did my S5 II review, I did some comparison with the Sony a7 IV, a7 R5 and the Canon R6 II. The S5 II was much smoother when I rely on just the IBIS itself. Even when I compared the S5 II to the GH6, I would say overall the S5II's IBIS is very similar, which surprised me quite a bit. But I did notice when I shake the camera a little bit too much, the S5II's image would end up just jump a bit while GH6 would handle it much smoother. 
Now, companies like Sony do provide software-based solutions to improve the IBIS result, and I would certainly like to do some more comparison in the future and test out this software solution. But I want to point out that all these digital image stabilization solutions, no matter it's done by the camera during recording or require additional software afterwards, have a few drawbacks. Digital image stabilization requires cropping the video a bit to provide room for correction by shifting the image area. And if the footage is blurry because of too much camera shake, digital stabilization system cannot fix that. Anyway, back to the S52X. I'm just really impressed by the performance of its in-body image stabilization system. It is not perfect. For example, if you're shooting with a lens that is 18mm focal length or wider, you will still see a bit of warping effect near the corner. But compared to the other full-frame camera that I have tried, it is easily the best. And that makes me wonder if Panasonic can bring similar kind of improvement to their next Michael Forfurt's camera. There are a few different options for you to do live streaming using the S52X without any extra dedicated streaming hardware. The first option is to connect the S52X to your phone wirelessly using Wi-Fi and then using Lumix Sync app, you can configure the RTMP RTMPS protocol connection and then stream your video to the internet. You can do live streaming at Full HD or HD resolution up to 60 frames per second. Depending on the resolution and the frames per second you choose, the bit rate is between 4 to 16 megabit per second and it uses H.264 compression for video and AAC for audio. If you want to live stream at 4K resolution, you can connect the camera to your phone using a USB cable. You will still use the Lumix Sync app to set up, so it's mostly the same as the previous option, but now you could live stream at 4K 30 or 25 frames per second. It also uses H.264 and AAC compression. Interestingly, the bit rate for 4K streaming is only 12.5 megabit per second, which is lower than the bit rate for the full HD 50 or 60 frames per second when recording in APS-C or pixel pixel mode. If you want the best quality, you can get an USB Ethernet adapter and connect the S52X to the wide network or directly to your computer. This option uses the RTP, RTSP protocol and it will give you the highest quality as not only it support up to 4K60, the bit rate is also a lot higher up to maximum 50 megabit per second. You can also choose the H.265 codec if you want. And since the H.265 codec is approximately two times more efficient, the image quality would be better than using the H.264 codec at the same bit rate. Ever since I have finished my Panasonic Lumix S5 II review, I have started to think how should I approach this S5 IIX review. After all, I've done a pretty in-depth review of the S52 Ready and the S52X is a very similar camera but with a few extra features and upgrades. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about everything again as a lot of you watching this video would have already watched my S52 review. But then I can't completely skip all those S52 features as they are a very important part of the S52X. It is a very interesting strategy that Panasonic is releasing two models that are very similar but one with extra software features but at the same time they are still offering an upgrade key to the base S52 model that offer the raw video output but not the rest. On the internet, I saw a lot of discussions and confusions about the difference between the two models. There are quite a few people thought you can just buy the S52 and pay for the upgrade key and then you can get all the S52X features. This kind of confusion is probably not something that Panasonic wants to see. So I wonder if there is no upgrade key available for the S52. Would it be better? After all, the price of the S52 
plus the upgrade key is roughly or even exactly the same as the price of the S5 2X depends on where you're from. But if we ignore that upgrade key confusion for a second, I think it is quite a good strategy. Offering a basic model that most people would be really happy with and that helps lower the price a bit because of some licensing fees and other R&D costs that you don't have to associate with the camera to make the camera more attractive. I'm quite interested to see the ratio of the S5 II versus S5 IIX sold because while I think the S5 II is one of the best value for money camera in the market, I think the S5 IIX provides even better value for money to users and also more versatile camera as long as you need one or two of those extra features. So if you are buying a S5 II or S5 IIX, maybe drop a comment below and let me know which one you choose and the reason. Now, if you are thinking of buying a S5 IIX and want to learn more about the S5 IIX, you should check out my in-depth S5 II review as everything in that review also applies to the Lumix S5 IIX.